So if we can see this pattern in patients, if they have this, then this will alarm us that there is something going on. Now, this is pretty obvious. This is obvious to pretty much anybody sitting even in the back of the room. These are visible alternans. The challenge is, is can we actually measure smaller amplitude alternans? So the oscillations I'm talking about now are so small that you can't see them, but they're still potentially causing risk in the patient. So these are invisible alternans. And there was a very nice study that showed that if you measure T wave alternans that are invisible, over time, as the alternan gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this is two hours before sudden death. So you can see that there is evidence that alternans presages sudden death. So we have, over the last several years, spent a lot of time trying to understand alternans. And our experiments first began by trying to determine whether it's actually present in the heart of patients who have heart disease. So to do that, we put some wires in the heart and actually try to measure this very tiny oscillation. And so what you see here are two recording electrodes in the heart. This is an x-ray picture. And each of these little black dots is a recording electrode. So we're actually recording from each of these dots. Now this is a complicated slide, but all I want to show you is two things. We're recording from three sites. And what you see is alternands of the T wave. It goes high, low, high, low, high, low. And the size or the amplitude of the alternands is different. Here it's not too big, but here it's much larger. So not only is there alternands in a patient with heart disease, but it's different all over the heart. Now, if we are going to use alternands to risk stratify patients, we have to develop a tool. We can't be measuring alternands inside the heart of everybody. And this is now the focus of our research. We are trying to develop a clinical tool where we can actually measure it very easily on the body surface. So we are now using computer simulations to develop this tool. And in the simulations, we basically put alternands in the heart and see how it spreads through the lungs and eventually reaches the skin. And this is an example of some of our data. The top figure shows you the heart. It doesn't look like a heart, but it is the heart. Just take my word for it. And the bottom figure is the front of your chest. And this top part here is your neck. So what we did was, in the computer simulation, we put alternands in the bottom of the heart. And then we saw where it would show up on the chest. And indeed, it does show up right in the middle of the chest. And the red stuff is very large amplitude alternands, which then get smaller and smaller. So this was very important information because it told us that if we are looking for this tiny signal, we have to look for it in a very certain area on the chest, not just anywhere. Now, computer simulations are just that. They're computer simulations. It doesn't replace real data in patients. And so we took the next step and tried to reproduce this data with patients who have heart disease. And this was a very kind research uh, patient from our, one of our studies who was wearing, it's not total body plate armor. <laughs> it's actually a very fancy ECG recording machine. Now, if you get an ECG at the doctor's office, you know that there's you know, about 10 or 12 little buttons that they put on your chest. Well, this patient was good enough to allow us to put 120 recording electrodes on the front and the back of the chest simply to figure out where is this tiny signal located? How well can we measure it if we can measure it everywhere? And this is some data that shows the recordings from four patients, A, B, C, D. On the left side is the front of the chest. On the right side is the back of the chest. And what you see is that in all four cases, the alternance magnitude is always in the very center of the chest. So it's very convenient for us now to record in exactly the same way in all our patients. So now we are taking this to the next level. We plan a study where we are going to measure the alternand signal in a very systematic way using something called a Holter recorder. This is a machine that a patient basically straps onto their waist, and there are some ECG leads that 
record information into the recorder. But the conventional recorders are very simple. They're too simple for our study because all they have are four buttons and they're all in the wrong place. So we scratched our head for the longest time to try and figure out how to do this properly. And what we've come up with is our own recording system where what we have is um, high density sampling in the center of the chest and a special 12 lead Holter monitor. This is a very special type of monitor that will allow us to pick up this very small alternand signal. And we have in fact partnered with a company in, in Europe to help us manufacture and use these recorders which is now very critical to the next phase of our research. So now let's get back to that diagram I showed you earlier. I talked about electrical instability. We also have a lot of interest in imaging scar burden. And we're doing that with something called magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Now MRI is not new technology. It's available in many hospitals. You see a picture of it here. It's a very large magnet with a table that goes through the bore and the patient lies on the table and goes through the bore and as the magnetic field interferes with the heart or uh, comes close to the heart, the MRI is able to generate some beautiful pictures of the heart. And so this is an example of it scanning through the heart and the information that we normally get is things like the size of the heart and the position of the different structures in the heart the information that we normally get is the function of the heart. How well do the different chambers pump? But what we're interested in is something quite different. We're interested in something called scar distribution. And this takes us back to that slide I showed you where a patient who had a heart attack many years ago then has changes in the structure of the scar over time. And what we want to know is where is that scar? How dense is that scar? And that itself, we believe, will give us information about electrical instability and the risk of developing alternands. So here's an example from one of our studies. We have the heart and we have this round black circle representing the muscle of the heart. And inside is the blood. So the heart is pumping blood and you see the blood in the center. But now have a look at this little crescent-shaped white area. What is that? Well, that's scar. That is the MRI imaging scar. And not only is it imaging scar, it's telling us where the scar is very dense. It's telling us where the scar is not so dense. It's giving us an idea about the heterogeneity of the scar. And that's the important thing in defining arrhythmia risk. And we now have computer algorithms that allow us to, in an automated way, quantify this scar heterogeneity, which we intend to do in patients to get a better idea about their risk profile. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was genes. Now, there are millions of genes in the body, and genes are what we're all about. So the challenge is what genes and what abnormalities in the genes may increase one's risk to sudden cardiac death. And what we've chosen to do is identify a few genes that may be linked to the development of alternands. And these are the genes that regulate something called calcium. Now calcium is important. We all, some of us take calcium supplements. They're good for our bones, but they're also good for the heart. Because calcium moving in and out of the muscles of the heart cells are important in regulating its electrical activity. And if the little components in the cells of the heart that cannot regulate calcium properly, then that'll cause problems. So we're interested in, just for simplicity, I'm going to call it gene number one. And we're interested in mutations in these genes that regulate calcium. And we've, in fact, focused our attention on identifying three important genes that we think may be important in the genesis of alternands and electrical instability.